degrees to welcome back everyone. It's 30. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah. This actually is, I believe, from, what we, from our historian uh, Chuck Houghton and Whitney, uh, this is our 14th year now. Wow. Okay. Pretty, uh, it's pretty exciting that we already have a whole bunch of, of, of good presenters coming or interesting pre present presentations for February and March. So it's a, I'm really looking forward to those. And uh, this year, you know, we, well, I should say, last year in, it was the first time in, in June, in, in June we had everything booked all the way to October. And so it was pretty fabulous. People were constantly coming up and saying, I'd like to do this. And I'd like, I got an idea for a presentation. So it's great. So uh, this year, the same. If anyone has uh, any idea you can, uh, that you would like to run by uh, us, uh, and we're open to everything. So just let Whitney know and, or let me know. Um, and we, it doesn't have to be, you know, because we've had some really unbelievable presentations and don't compare what you're going to try to do if you don't think it's going to measure up. We have all sorts of, of, of experienced uh, photographers here. So all levels of, of experience, I should say, so that um, where whatever your presentation is, it's going to be helpful to someone. So uh, uh, please let us know what you um, one, what you can do or would like to do, but the, on the reverse, what you would like us to do. So uh, I know Whitney sent something out about a month ago, and I know everyone's busy, but if, if there are uh, any topics uh, that you would like to see covered or that you don't really grasp or you would like a review of, please just um, let us know. I, we will send something out um, and try to make it real easy, just a checklist uh, and then add a, a room to add something on uh, if what you're interested in is not on the checklist. So please, uh, uh, we welcome your ideas uh, because we, I want, would like to have this as something that is helpful to everyone. I mean, you can't do one presentation that's gonna help everyone. Uh, with the exception of Tom's tonight, I should say. But uh, wait, wait, wait! No, I like the fact that you're lowering <laughs> expectations. Yeah, <laughs> that's no, where I want to no, start. No, 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 I, we're starting at the curb. Everything above this is gravy. So, <laughs> uh, no, 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 not at all. Um, so, what? Anything that you have? Again, I won't beat this to death. Please let us know. Uh, and now tonight. Um, I asked Tom a while back if he would uh, do this uh, presentation. I saw it at Sea Rovers, and I knew that it would be something that would be perfect. And this is the, the first time we've ever had a meeting, just one person. Uh, so, Tom, you better be real good. You know? <laughs> Thanks. So, <laughs> so no, it, it's, um, it, you know, we try to divide it up and have three presenters, but... Tom's uh, covers so much that it, it's really important to have one whole meeting. And then it's what Tom has done. Um, well, let's back up for a second. We all interested in underwater photography. We all try to take photographs. We try to take better photographs each time. We look at a scene, analyze it, how we're going to shoot it. Um, what Tom's presentation tonight will be something that takes from the scientific community, the art community on, on their um, influences or their ideas of what makes a good photograph. And so, um, I mean, we have, you know, throughout a lot of our meetings, we talk about the rules of, of composition, the rule of thirds and all this and that. These aren't rules that were made in uh, in Paris in 1745, when they all got together to decide what the rules are going to be. No, they are, they're rules that people see uh, what, what is pleasing to people. So, uh, Tom, instead of me rambling on, I'm going to turn it over to you. 
So first question is, um, can you hear me okay? Am I uh, clear enough? Okay. Yep. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And let's go to, this will be interesting because I'm gonna share the screen that I'm actually on before I go to the presentation mode. So I guess my first question is, is when this comes up, if you can just give me, let me know that um, the presentation is actually showing up, is it? Yes. Perfect. Yep, yep. Um, so um, Andy, thanks for the introduction. Um, when I um, first thought about this, it's um, I, I, it was actually tickled and kind of in the back of my mind when, um, and inspired by really who was somebody that I kind of consider my, my photography mentor. Um, I had the opportunity to spend a week with uh, Galen Rowell. And I don't know if some of you know um, who he is, but he's, he's a very kind of infamous um, mountaineering photographer. And he, he pioneered a lot of techniques and things. Um, but what I learned from him um, that I thought was really kind of fascinating was to look beyond just kind of the, the rules of artists and the rules of composition and stuff and really try to understand how what is laying before us in terms of a scene is being processed by our brain and what we ultimately end up with. Um, and he was the first person that actually um, suggested a book that was the start of all this. Um, if you're kind of wondering like what my background is in, the, is in this, um, I'm a crisis management consultant by day and, um, and then by training, I'm a geologist, which qualifies me to talk nothing about what I'm about to talk about. Um, and the reason, the reason I say that is I really want to be you know, a master artist, uh, a world-renowned biologist, neuroscientist, ophthalmologist, um, all kind of wrapped into one to really kind of understand this. And, it, and, and the book that he gave me was called um, The Eye, the Brain, and Vision by um, David Hubel, who is kind of the, the godfather of ophthalmology in terms of, of seeing and the visual processing. And that started me down a path of just kind of like chasing, chasing the rabbit, so to speak. So in this presentation, what I kind of want to do is not really answer so many questions as to generate questions that you're going to have. At the end of it, I do have a, um, a slide that I'll just leave up and you guys can take a picture of it or we can send it out afterward of kind of a lot of the resources that I have found really useful in terms of understanding this. Um, and and where, where I'm kind of going with this is that there's so much to learn about it in terms of understanding what, as, as Andy said, the, the artists have known kind of empirically. They've passed it down from generations. You know, they apprenticed under kind of another master artist and then they developed their own styles. But this knowledge of, of what works and what doesn't work and what makes a compelling, you know, piece of art and what doesn't was kind of passed down empirically. And it really wasn't until even in the last decade, 15 years, that we've gotten a better understanding of how our visual processing system is relating to those empirical rules. So there's still a lot of theory and it's still changing, of course, because that's science and what it should do. Um, so I'm gonna kind of go through some of these things and just um, take it from the, the perspective of, of looking at art and the way we see it versus what our brain's actually doing to help us make better underwater photos. So that's really kind of the starting point of this. Um, when I was first wrestling with this, um, what, I, what I was trying to figure out, and I threw, threw this up to the group to come up with a name for this kind of, this, this diagram that I'd come up with, um, which really was um, kind of trying to um, symbolize all the things that we need to know as underwater photographers. There's the camera and the technical bit, as well as the fact that we have to be divers before we can even be, you know, good underwater photographers. And then there's the element of a lot of, um, a lot of, um, of us have a, like a huge interest in, in the biology and the marine, the marine life. And so we kind of concentrate on that. And what seemed to be kind of missing a lot was kind of the art part of it and the science behind part of it. So what I was really wanted to do was, was kind of create an understanding of how do you get that compelling image as opposed to, you know, where you don't concentrate on any one of these areas and you really kind of bring them together into one kind of solid vision. Whereas if you're only working with two of these kind of major kind of like um, um, subject areas, you end up with photographs that are a little bit less than compelling. So it's kind of, you know, the sweet spot. Although I did really like the name that somebody came up with of the vexing vicious Venn diagram of underwater visual arts. That was just rolls off the tongue. I thought that was great. Um, so we're gonna concentrate tonight primarily on this. Um, for those of you that saw me do this at Boston Sea Rovers, the little, we have a little bit more time, so hopefully I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover a little bit more in a little bit more detail to make it a little less um, kind of superficial. Um, and also I'm going to cover it completely different than I did in Boston Sea Rovers because I lied then, I'm going to lie now. It's, it's, it's what I do. So um, anyway, or I'll fake it, right? Um, so just to make sure that everybody, I, by the way, I have my um, screen up so that I can't see kind of the reaction. So if I can just hear kind of a vocal, can everybody see in terms of the presentation, the colors, um, like the girl in the yellow shirt, just kind of give me a yes or yes. So it's kind of come through. Okay. Yes. So, so what's, what's interesting about this, this, this color photograph is that it's not a color photograph. 
it's actually a black and white photograph. And it has this grid of color laid over it that generates um, this kind of optical illusion of actually having a color photograph. And I wanted to use this as kind of the starting point to, to emphasize the idea behind what a camera captures and what we actually see are very different things. Um, and, and things like optical illusions wouldn't exist if our visual system didn't process something in terms of a stamped recording like a camera sensor, for instance. So in that sense is when I say everybody lies, um, there's ways to use um, the way our visual processing system works in order to, to, to really increase and enhance our understanding of, of how photography, um, you know, how, how we can create compelling photographs. So just to start from a foundation standpoint, and by the way, um, I, I speak fairly fast. Um, I always figure you guys can hear faster than I can talk. Um, but if you have any questions at all, just kind of like shout them out. Um, as I said, I can't see you, so um, don't hold up or raise a hand, just um, um, call out. Um, and, um, and I'll just go through and just kind of progress unless um, somebody, you know, screams out saying, hey, this is too fast, or I don't understand, or I've got a question. Um, so I thought we'd start with just kind of the, the, the foundation elements of, of really art, so that we're all kind of working from the same thing. Um, in, terms of, in terms of approaching art, um, you know, you've got the visual elements, which we think of as, you know, the lines and the shapes and the color and all those pieces. And I'm not going to talk about all these during the course of this, by the way, I'm just going to use these as, some of these as a sample. Um, and then you have the principles of how do you actually take these elements and put them together so that you create, you know, kind of the composition that you're, you're, you, you want. What a lot of um, art books and, you know, and kind of like the science of this, what they, what they tend to miss out in this piece is the other part of it is how does our visual processing system see these composition and these principles and how we've laid this out in order to generate those things that we refer to as kind of the rules of composition, which aren't really rules because the minute somebody tells you, oh, the rule of thirds, however, you can break it. And then you're like, well, when? And that's part of what we're hoping to you know, kind of touch on tonight is to give you an idea as to some of the science behind how these rules um, are created by these three kind of elements combining together to, to, to create kind of compelling pieces. Um, and, and, then, and then, so then you can literally take it and, and, and start to explore and also get a, start to build your intuition as to how you go, up, go about breaking those rules. So in terms of, um, um, I'm going to start this um, by what I refer to as the rules of composition at ludicrous speed. Um, we're not going to do hyperspeed, warp speed. It's going to be ludicrous speed. And by the way, shout out the movie references if you get them as I go along. I'm a total video file and, um, and I really make bad, bad dad jokes all the way through this, uh, according to my kids. So the, the first one I want to touch on is the rule of thirds. Um, and look at it from kind of the historical artist perspective and, and then start to look at how you know, it's, it can be applied underwater. The rule of thirds, looking at, looking at uh, Turner's um, painting here, um, Turner did a really good job and, and relied upon the rule of thirds a lot. Um, and by the way, um, and I'll touch on it a little bit in the, you know, as we go along, but the rule of thirds, um, the golden ratio, Fibonacci sequence, all these things kind of loosely translate together into this rule of thirds bit. And, and while they're, they're mathematically different, they end up kind of with, a, with an empirical um, similarity in terms of, of how you do composition. So Turner, um, in this case, looking at the fighting Tumere, is what he ended up doing was placing the objects very much in terms of the, the, the And he even took this a little bit, a slight kind of break of the rule of thirds by laying out, you know, the horizon and laying out the sky and where the sun, sun was and then the mass of the ship, in that he slightly even offset um, the, the, the Tamer coming in, being, being pulled into port by the tug, and the tug on the other side of the point of intersection of this kind of lower third quadrant, um, which creates a little bit of a, a sense of motion and a bit of kind of like, you can see that almost feel the kind of the tension between the tug and, and the boat coming in because of how it's placed. Um, the way we translate that into, you know, a typical underwater image is you look at something like this, which I took down off of North Carolina, and um, when you look at taking the rule of thirds and applying it against, against this image, again, it kind of, the points of interest are, are at these points of intersection. And that's kind of the whole idea of the composition, the rules of composition, is to draw our eyes and to draw, um, you know, what we're looking at. And we'll talk a little bit about the science behind why that needs to happen in a, in a moment. Um, in order to, um, when we both create them, but also viewing them so that when you're looking at these images, you, you can get a sense as to what is most important, what is the story that the photographer is trying to convey. Here you're looking at the, the ship is basically um, I'm done on the, um, the bottom third, kind of almost in, in many cases if it was a landscape shot, like kind of the horizon. 
Um, the, the, the shark itself is kind of on the top third with the eyes and the head being at one point of intersection. And then you can also tell there's kind of a nice balance even in terms of thirds of the shadowed part of, of the ship's hull versus the open water. The other um, kind of comes up a lot in terms of uh, rules composition, leading lines and triangles, um, which seem kind of, you know, we all talk about leading lines and triangles, but like, well, how do we really create them and why? And, and what I find so fascinating about this, um, especially in terms of leading lines and triangles is, if you look at this picture by Vermeer, there are no leading lines and there are no triangles per se. You don't see lines in here and you don't see triangles. And yet our visual processing system is, is capable of taking a three-dimensional world and we are totally accepting of the fact that we can, we can represent it in a two-dimensional fashion. And, and the way we do it in this two-dimensional fashion is because the way our eyes actually see these things that, that creates kind of implied lines, implied triangles, implied areas of focus. Um, again, something that artists have known for years and years, but we're only starting to understand why our eyes and the way our photoreceptors work and the way the mechanics of our eyes and the processing in our brain works actually create this. So when you look at Vermeer's Milkmaid, there's there, you look at the position of her body, you look at the position of the table, it all kind of creates this, this triangle that's leading up to her as kind of the point of interest. And then there's these kind of ancillary lines um, that are also the, the direction of the windowsill, the direction of, of the basket on the, on the top kind of leading again into that. And if you'll notice, it also enhances um, our sense of perspective because the, the diminishing perspective of the converging lines or these converging of the sill gives you kind of an, a feeling of depth. And, and that's really important in under, underwater um, because we have trouble um, really conveying depth because of the limited visibility, our limited ability to light into the distance. So taking that kind of the lines and triangles into an underwater example, this is my, my daughter, Kate, I'm down on the U353, I think it is off North Carolina. Um, they hate being my subjects actually, it's, yeah, they don't want to be my daughters any longer because they're just, they're tired of being always my, my subject of photographs. But in this case, again, there's very distinct leading lines leading into her specifically. And um, just give me a shout out. Can you actually see my mouse movement as well? Yes. Okay. So there's even kind of an implied triangle here as well, which I haven't highlighted, that also kind of directs your attention back in. Um, and yet there are no actual lines here. There's just degrees of contrast. Um, within kind of areas of the image that create those, those lines and, and, and the triangles. Same thing with this, um, th this photo that I took down in Bonaire of just a, of a turtle. Again, you kind of look at this and you go, okay, I can start to see in terms of dark and lightness where these triangles are happening. So the, the, the shape of the turtle itself um, and the way it's, it's positioned its body is creating one triangle. And then there's the triangle actually within that's helping frame that image and draw attention to the center. So I'm breaking a rule here of the never center your subject because that turtle is dead center, for instance. But I'm using a lot of the, the kind of the, the triangles in order to enhance and, and, and create the frame on a tighter scope than what the actual image is while giving kind of like balance and symmetry to the image, um, you know, by, by the, the sea life and the, 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 the flora and fauna off to the side. Talking about symmetry and balance, another kind of key thing in terms of composition is we, we, we use it a lot in terms of, um, um, you know, kind of creating a sense of harmony within, within an image. Um, da Vinci in his um, The Last Supper um, is kind of the, is the, the I don't want to say the archetypical or I can't pronounce that word, um, example of kind of, of symmetry. Because when you look at The Last Supper, um, it's a very pleasing composition and you don't feel any kind of like, um, discontinuity or, or tension in this, because when you, when you actually look at kind of how it's, it's balanced um, and how he uses kind of the diminishing, um, um, the perspective lines on each side of the, the, the dark kind of like archways create a sense of perspective and depth. Um, and yet all the elements in this image are very, very well balanced. So when you look at the image, it's a pleasing image to us. Um, and, and there's reasons for that again, that are kind of like based into science. So going back to the, 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 the picture of the turtle, same kind of thing is there's balance within, which allows me actually in this case to center my subject because I don't feel this, this any kind of tension from unbalanced photographs. And by the way, when I talk about symmetry and balance, there, is, there are different types of balance. There are times when you actually want an unbalanced photograph. You wanna create tension. There's all, you know, there's different, there's, there's different degrees of this. And um, the rules of composition, there are entire courses dedicated to composition. So I'm going through this again, kind of at a ludicrous speed, you know, with the idea that we've all kind of seen them, but I want to get into like why, why, do, why are they what they are um, in a little bit in this. 
another image that I took of, of my other daughter, my, um, my youngest daughter and her friends in the pool, same kind of thing in terms of it's a pleasing image. And in this case, I'm using the, the symmetry of the reflection, both to create the balance from the top and the bottom, but also um, to kind of focus um, where I want to bring the, 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 the viewer's eye into the photo. Um, and you can even see some in terms of a um, little bit of placement of the eyes and even the angle of the eyes actually bring, draw it into kind of the center figure. Um, uh, Jake, during one of his uh, presentations, also talked about the, the rule, you know, the rule of odds. Um, three, one, for some reason, and I actually don't know the answer to why that is, we find odd, um, odd numbers actually more pleasing in images like this than, than if it was only two people. Um, and then the last one is really kind of talking about filling the frame. Um, and I'm only gonna, I'm gonna bring this up because it also applies to us as underwater photographers. We don't have an unlimited amount of time underwater. So um, when I frame things underwater um, with the, the capability of the cameras and knowing that I can crop in and zoom and still remain, maintain a lot of the, um, um, the, the, the detail is I will loosely compose things so that I can address what I had an instinctive sense of while underwater um, later in, in, post, in post processing. And in this case, um, the subject there, if you look back, it's kind of, you know, you've got the, the, the rim back nudibranch and it's kind of, you know, a, a relatively, you know, boring background and your eye is naturally drawn to the nudibranch anyway. So if the story is about the nudibranch and the detail and, and people aren't as familiar with the subject, filling the frame is a great way to do it um, because our eyes, our eyes get tired of negative space. And so we tend to concentrate um, on detail itself. So filling the frame with, a, with an object to, in order to increase kind of our, our focus is, is a great way to do, to do that. And again, there's reasons you know, scientifically behind this. So just kind of a quick summary, the rule of thirds, golden ratio, Fibonacci, all that stuff kind of falls into those thirds. By the way, um, the third, the, the golden ratios, I mean, you notice if you're a 35 millimeter shooter versus a four thirds mirrorless shooter, um, the, some of the rule of thirds are a little bit more compressed um, and it works to your advantage in 35 millimeter and the, the golden, um, golden ratios, when you look at it, are the phi um, um, kind of like grid um, lends itself better to four thirds. That's just a tidbit I'm throwing out there for free for all the four thirds shooters that wanna dump their huge DSLR cameras like I do. Um, and then leading lines, triangles, filling the frame, symmetry and balance, and, um, and, and just the, the, the idea of using these to create compelling images. So before I go on, any questions at all at this point? Pretty straightforward in the compositions. So the nature of light. Um, before we get into the mechanics of the eye and kind of the science behind it, it's important to talk about like, what are we actually seeing? Um, and um, you know, I did learn everything I know about light, not from Newton, but rather through, um, you know, the Dark Side of the Moon album um, late at night in, in school um, using, I won't say, um, there may have been possibly a combination of herbs and, you know, herbs and spices involved, but I, I'm not going to admit to that. Um, so when you look at what we're actually seeing, we're seeing a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the electromagnetic spectrum, similar to sound, is really made up of waves. And in this case, it's the light waves. And the, 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 the frequency of those light waves um, actually generates what its hue is, you know, where it falls in terms of the color of the spectrum. So um, the, shorter, the, the shorter wavelengths, we get down into the shortest being like gamma rays in terms of ultraviolet, you know, being a little less short. And then the blue greens are on the shorter side. And then the longer ones are moving to the reds and then into, um, um, into kind of the, the infrared. We only see a small slice of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And there are some animals out there, including a lot of marine creatures that we'll see to either side of it, um, you know, that see sometimes in the ultraviolet, sometimes in the infrared. Um, they also see different colors um, on the spectrum as well, depending upon how their, their eyes are mechanically you know, made up. Um, but the idea is that it's a small slice. And the reason I bring this up is as underwater photographers, who hasn't seen, or even as scuba divers, who hasn't seen this, this, this diagram here, right? With the idea that the deeper we go, um, we start to lose and it strips out the longer wavelength, you know, longer wavelength part of the, um, the color spectrum. And we start to see, you know, obviously blues or greens up here in New England as we go deeper. And that does affect not only how we take the pictures, but how we perceive what we're, the, the scene we're seeing underwater. And then, um, and then ultimately how it is even viewed above land after we've taken it underwater. And again, I'll kind of get into that in a little bit. So let's talk about our visual processing system. And I'm not gonna turn you guys into ophthalmologists because one, I couldn't, um, I don't have that knowledge, but um, we don't have time because it's, it's really kind of a fascinating subject in my mind. 
So very simply, um, you can kind of look at the visual human, the, the human visual system with an analogy to the camera, with the exception that um, at the very end part in the processing, our brain, our camera stops at the actual camp capture on the sensor and our brain actually takes it to the next level in terms of the processing. So when you think about um, the, the, the way the eye works is, is it's, it's essentially, first off, it's, it's jammed into the bony occupant and it's held in, you know, held into our eye, obviously, I mean, into our, into our um, head, well, hopefully. Um, there is something called globe luxation that you'll discover if you start to chase this rabbit of information. Under no circumstances, Google globe luxation when you have a hard sneeze or you know trauma and the eye can pop out. Um, I'll wait while you guys actually Google globe luxation right now. Um, so the, the whole idea is that the, the eye sits inside of, of this cavity and then um, it's protected in such a way it's surrounded by fat and muscles and everything else that hold in place and allows it to move. But in terms of the, vi the way we actually see things is the image formation as the light passes in, it comes through the cornea, it passes through the lens, which then focuses the light to generate, to generate under the back of the retina. But as it goes through, our, our pupils will actually constrict, constrict, you know, constrict and expand very much to like the aperture on the camera um, to allow how more light, less light, and depending upon you know, the ambient light conditions and what we want to achieve. Um, and also in terms of depth of field also applies to the eye as well. Um, and then as the lights, as the lights um, uh, as pass through, it, it goes to the back here, which is essentially the retina under the back of, under the, back of the eye. And the retina is the, um, contains what I really want to get into, and I'm going to do in the next slide, is the, the rods and the cones, the photoreceptors themselves. How do we take this light energy and translate it into um, electrical single signals that are then passed on to our brain for the processing? Um, and things happen in that interpretation or that detection of the light signals and, and how, the, how it's done, and then even on its pathway through to the brain that really affects how we see things. So don't get overwhelmed by this diagram. Um, the reason I have this up here is because I, I basically want to just um, kind of consolidate the most important part, which is going to be the fovea and the cones and the receptors that I really want to get into. So the light passes in, as I've shown here, through the direction of the light into the back of the eye. What's, what's happening along here is the mac, you know, you'll have the, the macula, which contains both rods and cones. So rods and cones um, are throughout the retina, but there's definitely a difference in distribution of, of how these are. And just kind of a quick overview. The rods you may have heard, and I'll talk a little bit more and go a little bit more detail, are really, um, are not very good at acuity. Um, they're, they're good at yeah, motion, at values of, um, you know, intensity, or, you know, artists use the term value, we use the term luminance when we're, we're talking about that. So rods are really good at that. Cones can do it, but they don't do it as well as, as, as rods do. Cones, though, are the ones that are capable of seeing color. And from the color, the, the, the cones themselves generate color. You know, I mean, generate, you know, they, they, they're they more responsive to certain colors. So which is why you've often heard that we have like red, green, blue cones or, you know, long, medium, short wavelength cones in our eyes is that what's that really saying is it's, it's being responsive to a certain spectrum within, um, with, of light. Um, and, and so all the cones, when you look at this upper right-hand corner, if you look at it, um, this, this is really kind of a depiction, very similar to what we see in terms of weather, you know, radar weather images, where hot, you know, the hot colors, the reds and the yellows is showing a great concentration or intensity, um, whereas the blue and cooler colors are showing kind of a lack of. And if you look at this, you can see this is a projection. So we're coming in through here and we're looking at a projection across the back of, of kind of a cross section across the back of the macula. And as you're looking at it, You've got the cones and the rods dis distributed here, whereas there's very little anything happening out here except for cones. And as you start to move in, there's greater and greater concentration of cones until you're actually into the fovea here. And the fovea is this depression right here. The greater the depression, the greater the number of cones that can be jammed into there. And the cones are responsible for our, our greatest acuity. So uh, what I want you to do right now is just kind of give you an idea um, as to why this is so important is, you can look away from the screen for a minute. And I want you to hold up your, th your, your hand with your thumb um, at a distance, so just kind of arm's length, and look at your thumbnail. And just gaze at your thumbnail and look at the detail of your thumbnail. Without moving your eyes, essentially what you start to realize is that you can see the acuity there, but items to either side start to fall off. If this was like an eye chart, you'd see the, you know, whatever number you're looking at very clearly, but the numbers to either side would start to, you know, decrease in acuity. That's because what you're looking at when you look at that thumbnail, thumbnail is it's the center of your gaze and it's lining up with the fovea. So the light is, is, is hitting an area of your eye that has the greatest concentration of cones for the greatest acuity, which provides the greatest detail. 
But because we've only got this limited area, we have to move our eye around in order to see um, the greater acuity, which is part of why we always talk about, oh, we're going to lead our eye through the image. Well, why do we need to do that? We need to lead it through because we can only see acuity, acuity in greatest detail in a very small area of our field of vision. The rest of it, as you can see down here, is made up primarily of the rods. So the rods are very, you know, very heavily, and there are no rods within the cone. The other thing that's interesting about this is when you look at how the light comes through um, into the cells itself, um, it passes, it passes, you know, there's essentially, it's almost in reverse, and there are eyes that are done this in a different way, but the light passes through this. And even though it's the density is there, it's enough to allow light transmission back to the, um, the pigment epithelium and to these rod, the photoreceptors here, which then basically take the signals that they're getting, um, the light energy, translating it into you know, electrical signals, which are be then being sent up through you know, bipolar neurons, ganglion, um, ganglion um, cells, and then, then into the optic nerve and then out through the optic nerve and back into, you know, into the brain for the processing. What's interesting about the rods and the cones is when you look at the number of rods that we, you know, the rods and cones we have is first off, we have many, many more rods than we do cones. So our eyes outside of that little bit of acuity is great for motion detection and seeing at night in dim light. Um, and, and that's really kind of its purpose, especially as a predator, not wanting to become prey. Um, that sense of motion when we aren't focusing on something is, is critically important. The other thing you'll notice is the rods in this case, are the, what I'm showing here is the purple there can be many rods, up to 100 rods attached to any single ganglion cell. So the ganglion cell, even though it's getting information from all these rods, it can't really distinguish which rod is generating it, which again kind of promotes the idea that we don't have great acuity there. Whereas the cones have a dedicated ganglion for every cone. So if you've got a red or a long, you know, a, a long wavelength cone, for instance, it's going to be, um, it's going to be, um, um, seen and, and the greatest acuity and the, the electrical signal is not going to be mashed up with a bunch of other electrical signals as it's passed to the brain. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this when you look at this is the, dis, the, the amount of rods, you know, I mean the amount of cones that we have and the distribution of them. When you, when you look at it, we have predominantly red cones in our vision. I don't evolutionarily know why that has happened, but it kind of goes back to something I think I said in an earlier talk when I talked about my 10 favorite images. If you ever want to sell a photo, throw red into it red fish, red anemone, red barn, whatever it happens to be, and we respond to it. Um, I'd be interested, kind of like, I'm still trying to track down why that is. We have fewer green cones, and we have only about 2% of the blue cones. So when you start thinking of us going down as divers into a deeper, deeper environment, the, the, the receptors that we have for greatest acuity are the, in the least abundance. You know, they're down in the green and the, green and the blues, which are far less, um, in, you know, in far less numbers throughout our entire um, eye and even in, within the cone itself. So any questions in this? Because this is kind of the, the a key part before I start moving on. And um, a Andy or um, um, Whitney, if you can, if, if you're looking at monitoring the questions, um, if you want to shout something out, if there's a comment that I'm not seeing in the chat or whatever, just let me know. So when I talk about, you know, kind of the, what they're actually, you know, the, the, the responsiveness um, of these cones and rods to light, they vary depending upon where they are in the spectrum. So when, you know, when you think of like looking at, um, you know, all together, the cones on average work better in daylight, which is brighter light, warm colors, daylight. This is kind of this area of the spectrum here. The rods work better um, and really see the abundant, the predominance of the light. Um, when it starts to get dimmer in terms of um, moving into these, these wavelengths, which actually means that our vision is shifting in terms of its acuity from being more rod, you know, um, cone responsive to being more rod, more rod responsive. And when you, look at, when you look at kind of the breakdown of just the cones in terms of how they see things, so we've got these, these three rods of the red, green, and blue. Over here is the, um, the blue at that 2%, the, you know, with the, the short wavelength. Um, these are response curves. So it's not as if, hey, this only sees red. Every cone sees to some degree the other color. So the long cones or the red cones will see into the red spectrum, but they also see yellow, they also see green, they also see blue, but they're most responsive. That the height of the response, you know, the response is, is happening up within, in this case, it's yellow. We lied a little bit and it's referred to them as the red cones. But together, what ends up happening is they average out and they look at each one of these responses and they compare the cones to each other to come up with what are we actually seeing? What is the detail we're seeing? What are the lines we're seeing in terms of color contrast and luminance um, detection levels of luminance? And it's those three things together that actually allows us to create that kind of acuity and detail. So 
the, the, the processing system itself going to that last piece is after a camera captures it, a sensor captures, captures the information and the sensor is really distributed the same in terms of the red, green, and blue kind of receptors that it has throughout throughout the, the, the entire um, uh, camera sensor, whereas our eyes clearly are not because we're heavily distributed with, you know, heavily focused on, on the red cones and where they're distributed is very different. We do not have that in the camera sensor. So already what's happening with the camera is different than the way we're processing. So once the retina takes that information and then it passes it through, you know, the, along the optic nerve and it goes out of the eye and then starts to work its way into the brain, additional processing actually starts to happen. Um, and it gets into, you know, it goes into the thalamus and then the primary visual cortex, which about 70%, I want to say, of our brain is, is working and committed to our visual sense. Um, so it's a lot of brain power there. And the visual, the primary visual cortex, like, like any good manager, actually takes that and distributes certain pieces out to other parts of the brain to have them manage it and figure out stuff. Um, and what ends up happening is it really kind of goes into two process or two, two streams, the dorsal stream, and the ventral stream, which is otherwise known as kind of the where system and the what system. So the where system is, is very much of the kind of motion perceptive, like I said, depth perception, spatial organization. Spatial organization is really interesting. If, if a lot of this, by the way, the science came out from um, people studying, you know, the brain lesions, or if people have had strokes that affect certain areas, um, they actually went through and kind of compared what they actually saw of certain images to, they would have them draw out what they saw. And, it, and, and you could see how, you know, how the where system or the what system was, was affected by whatever ended up happening to them. I think Picasso, frankly, had some sort of brain lesion because I look at his stuff and I just don't get it at all. Um, but his spatial organization is really looks like um, he was a, he should have been one of these, these scientific studies. Um, so, so certain parts of the brain are looking at it. So obviously the information is actually kind of cone dependent through there. There's also what's happening in the what system, which is going to have a lot of the heavy from the um, I mean, from the, the rod is, is the wear system and the cones are very heavy on the what system. So it's really good at color sensitivity. Um, it's slower in terms of its response. Um, it's, it's got the greatest acuity for us to actually see the detail. And, and its contrast sensitivity isn't as great as, as rods themselves. Um, what's interesting about this is as it's getting passed on to there, there are actually cells in our brain that account that, that are oriented to look at contrast or those lines we talk about if they're happening in certain directions. So they're actually orient, orientation, they're, they actually have an orientation with what they can and cannot see or what they're gonna pass along into these two, these two um, um, streams. And there's also cells that are even dedicated to object recognition. And most importantly for us is face recognition. And even though you think of face, the fish in terms of the eyes and everything else have a lot of biological similarities. So we find that our cells respond to biological similarity. Um, and it's not because oh, we just like it, it's actually because we have cells that are designed to do that in our visual processing system. So in terms of how we actually look, I already kind of mentioned that we have to kind of, we'll look through, you know, gaze around. Um, if my, my French teacher would kill me for this, um, I refer to it as it's cicades in terms of my great Midwestern pronunciation, but saccade is, is another, um, um, this is a kind of probably the, the, I wouldn't say proper French pronunciation of this, but really it comes down to is saccadic movement is our eye movement. We have both voluntary and involuntary eye movement. Um, while we're just sitting here and you're looking at the screen right now, wondering whether you're going to be looking at the text that I've got there, or you're looking at the image to the right, um, your eyes are moving at two to three fixations per second without you even trying to, before you even start to incorporate. That actually plays into a lot of the reasons why we have certain, um, certain um, um, optical illusions and why um, it's really important for us to understand what those illusions are as we compose our, our, our photographs because it plays, it plays into kind of like how we respond um, to the image itself. So we actually, with the saccadic movement and voluntary, is we will look through the frame and, and quickly shift from one area to another, um, building up over time this, this kind of, you know, um, using the acuity of this, this small area to build up kind of an impression of the overall um, um, image. What's interesting about this is that we don't look at one image and all of a sudden like a camera, we've got it all. It's not like it's all there and it's processed and everything else, which is why going back to that first image we had with the illusion of the black and white photograph, our brain fills in. As it jumps around looking at this, it sees certain clues. It looks for clues in terms of contrast and color and it fills in the details. 
Um, for those of you who heard the terms, you know, Gestalt per perception, that there's there's many different types of principles under the Gestalt perception. That's that's kind of the ideas of what it talks about is, you know, figure ground and filling in the details. And, you know, is it is it the old woman I'm looking at or is it a young woman in a hat? Those are all kind of generated by the fact that we are we are searching around um, to generate a an image in our mind and the way we process it as opposed to what may actually be there. Um, and you need to actually generate and look around because since we've we've only got a small fovea and a small concentration, we've got to look around the image in order to, to really understand what's happening throughout, which goes back to why we want to like direct people's gazes intentionally when we look at, at, at photographs. So you guys are probably blinking now at this one. What I want you to do is look at, at one point in this grid. It's called the Sinulani grid. It's actually a derivation um, of uh, the Herman grid. Um, this was created back in like 1994. They really didn't understand why, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what you may or may not be aware of witnessing right now, um, what was happening until almost 15, 20 years later when they started to understand kind of how the photosoppers for receptors are working. So when you're looking at straight on and you've got your greatest area of acu you know, acuity, you're seeing a white dot within this grid. But if you hold your gaze there without really, you, your, your eyes are shifting, even though you're not willing, you're willing them not to, you'll start to see black, um, black dots in the other areas where if you turn your gaze and start to look at another area of the grid, you'll see it white, but you're like, hey, that was black just a moment ago. Why is that happening? Well, what ends up happening is it's actually, again, going back to the way our photoreceptors do this, and it plays a real key role in terms of how we want to create photographs, in terms of working with, and you're going to hear me term this um, a couple of times, equiluminance, um, in terms of um, um, light and dark, as well as color, you know, equi equicolor um, luminance in terms of like color contrast. So the color contrast versus the light dark contrast um, plays is, is, is a physical thing, not just a, um, a kind of like a, a desire and, a, you know, what we like to see. So what's actually happening here is when you look in, in this term, it's represented in this, this example, it's represented by the yellow circle in the center, is when you're gazing at that, you know, that yellow circle, what's happening is you're, you're primarily at cones. Um, the, you, there's no need for, um, you know, kind of what I refer to as lateral inhib inhibition, which basically means that our photoreceptors, I, I talked about how they, you know, move into the bipolar into the ganglion cells. There's actually cells that connect. There's horizontal cells, there's amacrine cells. Again, I wish I was a biologist to understand all this. But those cells kind of cross talk to each other. And, and both in terms of color, in this case, we're looking at um, this grid is black and white. So we're looking at luminance contrast, but it also applies to the color is they actually will have something referred to as a center surround effect. So there's a center surround effect where what you're looking at and where your gaze is concentrated is seeing the greatest detail, but there's no need for kind of like that lateral inhibition, which the surrounding cells are actually inhibiting those electrical signals. So when it's seen gain on one, the cells around are cross-talking and there's, they're realizing that it's happening, you know, there's, there's gain. And so it actually darkens um, or inhibits the, the transmission of those electrical impulses, which creates those dark spots. And as soon as you shift your vision, then all of a sudden that becomes white and the next kind of step over um, needs, needs the, um, um, the, the inhibition of, of, you know, in this case, luminance. In terms of color, though, the same thing happens from color in, and there's a theory called, it's color opponency theory, in terms of antagonism, the way we, we process color in our eyes is we'll see those red, green, and blue, and then it, it, it forms them with black and white intensity um, in an antagonistic way to actually create um, um, what our perception of the color is. And the same kind of effects happens in the center surround where you'll have one predominant color, and if the color next to it, especially a complementary color, um, is, is more antagonistic in terms of our eyes, you'll actually see a reduction in the light sensitivity to that. So it increases this, this color contrast rather than have kind of an, an, an equal um, color um, um, perception or reception um, within your eyes themselves. A lot of information, I get that. So what are we actually doing here when, you know, you talk about how this brain's doing this, it plays all these visual tricks on us, artists have known this for all these years, you know, that they've built up over time, you know, Da Vinci passed it along, um, you know, and ultimately you look at, you look at just these great artists and, and they just kind of build on the, the former ones in terms of this empirical knowledge. And we're starting to understand this scientifically. So as we go through, we start to understand a little bit more about our, the way our eyes dealing with this is we can actually use some of these effects and these, I want to say it's not all an illusion, but it's the way our eyes generate illusions um, to our advantage when we're creating compelling interests. Um, so how do we do that? 
So the first one is let's let's talk about kind of color cr contrast and equiluminance. Um, this was a, a painting by Monet, um, Impression Sunrise. Actually, it's where the whole impressionistic movement got its name um, because he called this Impression Sunrise. And oh man, did he get beaten up? Um, the critics hated this. They actually hated the way they'd work with these broad brush strokes and you know equi you know this is kind of equiluminant colors um, and pastels and everything else. And as I'm, I'm going to play kind of an image right here, and yet they were masters at really understanding without knowing why, what was happening when people viewed this. So when you view this and you're looking at this, this, this image, you look at the sunset and if you gaze at the sunset, it actually varies a little bit. It has this kind of like shimmering quality to it. And the reason it does is, and I'm gonna play this right now. The reason it does is that your brain is actually seeing this in terms of black and white as being the same um, value or the same luminance. So as you turn this into a black and white photo, the color, the, the sun actually disappears. Um, so your eye, your color cones are seeing this color, but your brain and the rods are not, you know, it's not seeing the color, the, the rods are not seeing the contrast. So they're confused. And because of the cross, you know, this cross talking is, they don't know what to believe. So your brain is kind of trying to process both of them and it ends up kind of vacillating between the two. And when your eyes doing the saccadic movement at the same time, it exacerbates that because you're moving across these lines of, of contrast that are showing up as a color contrast, but not as luminous contrast and vice versa. So, so when he created this, he knew that, you know, and, 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 our, and you look at these paintings, you realize when you stare at long enough, just what's starting to happen and you don't understand how he did it. It's because of the way our, our photoreceptors actually do that cross communication, as I was talking about, like the horizontal and the amacrin cells. Similarly, this one hurts because what we're looking at here is essentially two colors that are of, of the same luminance or the same value. Um, taking that a step further is, is, is that if the edges of these colors are slightly blurred, it further confuses our, our kind of cones. Um, and comparing it to the, the contrast of the rods, um, it's, our, our brain is, gets confused, which is why we look at this and that we struggle with it. But if we increase the luminance of one color over the other, what starts to happen is you can start to actually distinguish these better. It becomes in better relief. You have greater color contrast. The color contrast is not at odds with the luminance contrast. So you can start to actually see this. The reason this is important is as we descend in the water column and we're going increasingly into a blue and you know the blue green environment, what you're seeing is blue going back to the response curves that, that I talked about before is, is we're actually shifting our vision more to a rod. So, so our rods are responding more in the in the in under depth. And as a result, these things that appeared blue actually look like they're brighter when you're underwater. So the blue and in the, the blue and the greens in those spectrum take on a greater luminance to us than other colors would. Um, whereas when you come up shallower, one is the opposite is starting to affect and you're going back to where you're, you're now into more into the cones response and the cone C contrast, both in terms of luminance and in terms of color. And it's not at odds with the, with the rods, but you are seeing a, a greater um, degree of response from cones and there's no kind of like confusion between the two. So when you view a scene underwater, and you take a picture from there and you bring it up to the surface, it actually looks different than what you saw underwater, not just because you're, you're viewing it in a different light, but the consequence of viewing it in that different light, which is that you have different, um, different photoreceptors that are being activated while you do that. So you have to bear in mind when you're underwater, what am I looking at versus what do I want to see when I'm actually looking at it above land? So this one is actually designed to do kind of to emphasize what's actually happening because when you get that crosstalk, you get a sense of motion. Um, when you're looking at the dead center into this black dot here, what's actually happening is when, when you know, and this was, um, it's funny because Monet used this in his, and I'm gonna butcher the name of this. Um, Le, it's the La Grenouille, Grenouille um, series, which is basically his paintings of a boathouse and a bath. And the water was comprised of these colors of kind of the, the, the blues, the white, the black, and the mustard color. He actually did in that water. So when you're concentrating on those paintings and you're looking at you know, one area of it, the water actually gives this sense of motion the same way you're kind of seeing this creation of an illusion here. So he was doing this, recognizing it long before somebody came up with this you know, optical illusion, which they then, you know, every TikToker in the world wants to use, obviously, because it's cool. But your brain is basically cross-talking because as your eyes are moving, it's starting to detect 
differences in those contrasts that are at odds with um, the luminance contrast that your cones are seeing. And as a result, it provides this kind of sense of motion. Um, think about what the implications are for when you're taking photographs on the, uh, you know, when you're, when you're taking photographs above or what, that are involving water, like lighthouses or something like that, like I do a lot of times when I come up from a surface after a dive, is it has implications. So I'm not beyond going in and changing the hues a bit um, on the side, not so that it's obvious, but so it starts to trick the eyes a little bit and you start to create equiluminant things to actually create that surrounding field so that when you're looking at the object like the light, like a lighthouse, the waves may have a sense of motion uh, you know, with it as well for just that reason. There was an interesting study that was done. Um, it's actually been done a number of different times, but they did a 10 minute eye trace, which again is kind of like, where are you looking at a photograph? And not only do we, you know, as I talked about, have like dedicated cells towards certain objects and biologically familiar things, um, we also have a tendency to be looking for, for contrast, which goes back to the leading lines and, and triangles and all that. We see edges beautifully, um, whether they're color edges or they're, they're luminance edges. And so when you look at the, the, the way this 10 minute eye trace occurs is, so the first thing is there's a heavy concentration on the, the human figure, again, biologically attractive to us. But also now you're looking at the roaming of the eyes and it tends to attract toward light over darkness, again, has implication for us when we're looking at these relatively monochromatic um, um, scenes we see when we're at depth without any kind of artificial light. Um, and, and the eye basically follows those different kind of edges, which we can use to great effect to lead them in certain directions within in the, in the eye. Um, to kind of um, exacerbate kind of, or to, to illustrate kind of that, that light darkness and the edges and the contrast, looking at this, how many, I just wanna make sure that, um, cause this is a really subtle thing. Um, with a, and, and if you can verbalize this for me, can you see that on the left-hand side of the screen, it's a little bit darker than the right-hand side of the screen? Is that coming across in terms of yeah, projection? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So what I want you to do is kind of step back from your screens a little bit, put the edge of your hand up, close one eye, put the edge of your hand up and block that line, um, that edge in the center of the screen with your hand. What happened? They're the same color. They're the same value. Is everybody getting that? Yeah. So think about the implication of this. Our brain sees this discontinuity here, starts to have this lateral inhibition a little bit, detecting the contrast. It starts to focus more and it fills in what it's think is happening for the rest of the rest of the image. When you remove that, all of a sudden the image takes on the same value. Think of the implication in some of our photographs. And I'll talk a little bit about what I actually do and how I quote cheat in post. But post, I think, is something where, you know, people look at post and say, oh, you Photoshopped that. And it's like, well, yeah, I did, but I didn't necessarily do it to create an illusion or create something that wasn't there. What I did it was to emphasize what our visual processing system saw in reality that our camera didn't capture. So I will go in, in post sometimes, and this is actually, this line right here, all they did was down the center of this line is it's a slightly deeper exposure as you start to come in here, which all of us that have worked in post can be accomplished with a, with a blurred brush. And I'm not beyond going in on lines that I want to emphasize or where I want to direct the attention to use that technique in a very subtle way to emphasize lines. The same way an artist, when they're doing a pencil sketch or something, will darken the line itself and then fade it out. Same, same concept is at work here. So you can create interest through this whole kind of luminance contrast. So I took the worst photo that I've ever taken in my life, I think underwater, which is this one on the left. Um, and all I did was really just change clarity and sharpness. And we love clarity and sharpness. And all of a sudden it's a better photo to us because it's, it's, our, it's, it's appealing to the way our photoreceptors actually translate those, those electrical signals, light and dark edges, boundaries, all of that. Um, in the same way that you take this exact same photo and an essentially monochromatic ambient light green image, and you start to pull back into the color instead of this kind of equal colors, um, you're starting to see now color contrast, which again provides more visual interest to us because we're starting, the, the brain is seeing both the value difference in the luminance, it's also seeing the difference in terms of the colors, which is appealing to us and there's no kind of um, dis disconnect between the two or crosstalk that's confusing our brain. So we find this. One of the things I'll talk a little bit about um, is the whole idea of using clarity and sharpness and everything else, which are probably our go-to tools the most. And while I did the color and contrast across this entire image in kind of terms of an equal level, is you can use it, as I'm gonna point out in just a moment, you can use it to great effect to focus the eyes through local brush applications or local applications of clarity and contrast. 
So look at again, kind of at depth is, is in terms of just luminance, we're losing color value as we go down and things become increasingly monochromatic. Um, by the way, see this nice triangle here? And you've got this nice silhouette that creates these beautiful boundaries. And then you've got detail in here that is that you can kind of, you can look at, but at the same time, these two sides of the frame are balanced, which is why I, this is an image that I really like. Um, but as we're going deeper down, remember our blue cones are primary, are, are becoming the predominant photoreceptor along with our rods. Um, so we're losing the ability to, to contrast, to see color contrast um, without the aid of artificial light. Um, our acuity decreases as a whole. So now you're starting to think as we're going down into depth, we bring artificial light to, you know, basically restore some of that, but we can't create artificial light everywhere. So you want to kind of keep in mind what's ambient light that's being fooled by my brain while I'm underwater and what is artificial light that I can actually, you know, I can deal with in terms of color contrast and enhance that. Um, so when you're actually you know, doing these things, and, and by the way, the whole, the whole reason for this, um, and I kind of started to dive into this, was everybody's like, oh, I've got these rules of composition. How do I break them? And go, oh, well, you know, you can break them sometimes. You're like, well, when? It's like, well, you'll know. And you're like, how do you know? I want, I want you know, you guys to kind of like generate the questions that come out of this and go afterwards going, I want to learn more about this so that you start to build your intuition about what's happening here. So when I'm taking a photograph underwater, you know, I'm more consciously thinking about it um, in, in the initial as I started to do this and it becomes more subconscious, but I'm thinking about what's happening in my brain in the ambient light areas of the scene versus the, the, the artificially lit areas of the scene. So kind of going back to, um, you know, creating interest in, in, you know, by leveraging our photoreceptors and, and the way, you know, some of the way our cells are processing it, going back to the face and biological dedicated cells is when you look at an eye trace again of, of this woman, it goes to the eyes, it goes to the mouth, it goes to the features that resemble, you know, kind of the human, it's the human face and the features that we see, that we think are key to that. Um, similarly, in terms of a photo of this, this close-up macro of a fish, you're looking, like, do I say that, by the way? I mean, Osley is probably has um, the entire, and, and Andrew, and well, Andy, all you guys, let's put it this way, everybody but me knows exactly, probably right down to like the species, you know, um, and the classification method, exactly what this, I just say fish, because I'm a noob when it comes to marine um, creature and, and identification, although I do know what this is. Um, so the idea is, is our eyes are drawn to the eyes. Um, we're drawn to biologically familiar things, and you can leverage that to create photos of where you want the eyes to go to first in an image. They're going to go to biological familiar, they're going to go to light first, then they're going to start to work their way along edges and boundaries of light. So you're tying all those together as you do this. So when you look at, at Renoir's um, painting here, um, you can look immediately, and, and the first place that your eyes are normally drawn to are, I mean, the first place that it's drawn to is really in the eyes. And if you look at this as if it was a photograph as opposed to a painting, it's as if Renoir took the sharpness and the clarity and a brush and did it just primarily over the features of, of her face. And then reduced the clarity and started to make it, um, the, the edges a little bit more blurry, a little bit fuzzier in other areas of, 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 in, you know, of the subject. They're still of interest, you can still see them, but it's not the first place that your eye goes to. And, and that makes it interesting because you, you go there and then you start to look and explore other areas of the, the, the image that um, are also generating interest in, and, and are compelling. But by, by focusing on um, some place and, you know, within wherever your subject is with the greatest acuity and the greatest clarity and the greatest sharpness on that, you will naturally have people kind of drawn there. So you can do that in your photographs as well as enhancing it in post. So, I actually had that in mind when I was doing this. Um, this is under four constitution. Um, I had a wide angle lens, what I should have been doing more macro at that point. Um, and it was a wide angle zoom. So what did I do? I actually decided to zoom to create um, the acuity. So I, I zoomed during a slow exposure capture on this um, intentionally with the idea that I'm gonna blur everything except the, the, the center of, of the focal area, which is the, the stars. So kind of, you know, it's not a Renoir, I get it, um, but, what it does here is immediately you're drawn to the, the, the main point of focus, the main subject here, which is the, the sea stars. And then the other areas of the, inter, of the, the, the area, um, the other areas of the, um, the, the image are interesting, but they're not the first place that you're drawn. So it allows me actually to break that centering the image thing again, because of how I'm drawing the eyes through another um, technique, which is through just acuity, as opposed to um, areas that we find, you know, visually pleasing and in, in, in harmony with what we see in nature all the time. 
So the last piece is, is that whole kind of, as I was referring to a little bit, is the spatial familiarity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, when I first started was the concept of, you know, the rule of thirds, um, you know, Fibonacci sequence, golden ratio, spiral. These are all, you know, this is that, you know, the Fibonacci, you know, kind of the, 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 the Fibonacci sequence, golden spiral. Um, mathematically, they are slightly different, but they kind of generate the same thing. Um, it's that one to one set, 1.6 approximate, it's actually 1.681 or something, um, ratio of, of, um, of where our eyes are naturally drawn. And you see it in nature all the time in terms of, you know, when you look at certain things, you'll see kind of this increasing, this is basically, if you start at the center, you're breaking out into that 161, 161, 161, and, and ever expanding rectangles, which creates a spiral it's showing up in hurricanes, nautilus shells, um, the spiral of this woman doing, you know, kind of like slinging her hair. When you look at um, things like sunflowers, Fibonacci sequence. So what, what, what it comes down to is we see it, even though it's subconscious, so often in nature that it's actually achieved kind of this familiarity to us and we find it pleasing, which is why the rule of thirds works so well. But within the absence of other, you know, other techniques or other compositional, um, you know, um, um, principles that you want to apply, essentially you're going to be going to these, these points of intersection that happen because of the generation of these, these kind of, you know, the, the rule of thirds, so to speak, or these kind of mathematical um, ratios that we see. The Parthenon was built that way. You'll see this, once you start thinking about it and you start exploring it, you're going to start seeing this in nature all the time, which really creates this kind of like familiarity. So when we look at an image that follows that or implies that, we find it um, kind of comforting and, and appealing, whereas something that doesn't, we either find jarring or it's not interesting to us. The last kind of concept that I want to talk a little, a little bit about is, is the idea of the local versus global inconsistency. Because of our ability um, or our inability to see everything all at once like a camera sensor, we actually are very tolerant of inconsistencies between the entire image and what we see on a very small scale. So going back to even to that black and white photograph is locally, when you're looking at a very small size scene, you can see the color in there, you can see the black and white, but you understand that the color is being filled in and the rest of it. Here, when you look at this triangle of shadows and textures, um, every triangle, there's no kind of you know, discontinuity or unnerving thing that's happening at the, on each individual um, um, cube in this triangle. But when you back away and you look at this triangle of cubes in its entirety, it's not possible. You know, the, the shadowing and the texture does not work. Similarly, on the image to the left, is I actually placed a strobe um, in front of and behind um, um, the, the rocks, so you can see kind of the shadow, it's lighting up the counters really well, and it's lighting up um, Ed Yu's face very well, but the light that's happening on the, um, on the anemone is actually coming from the strobes on my camera. And normally, if you saw this, if this was all happening at the same time, you'd be like, I'm getting double shadows here, or that doesn't seem consistent, but it seems perfectly natural when we're looking at an image like this underwater, it doesn't, it doesn't come across as, as inconsistent. So we can use lighting from different directions to create depth and texture because we want that perspective, we want those lines, we wanna see edges better um, in different areas in inconsistent ways and still generate kind of a compelling, consistent overall image. So to sum up, because there's no time to explain, following quote, one of my favorite all-time movies here. Um, looking back at the rules and, and, and why they kind of work from a scientific perspective, you're, you're, you know, again, things that empirically artists have been doing for generations and generations, and we're only starting to understand a little bit now. So you look at the, the rule of thirds. It, approximate, it, it really approximates kind of these naturally occurring, as I said. It feels familiar. We see it in nature all the time, even if we're not aware of it. Um, I think as you start to explore and learn more about like things like the rule of thirds, the golden ratio, and you start looking at, at, at the scene in the scenes in the world, you're going to start to understand that you are seeing this more and more, which is also why it gives a sense of comfort and, and these points of intersection generate interest for us. Um, it definitely directs where our eye goes because again, we can't capture the whole scene. So we go to certain points and usually at these points of intersection and wherever those are occurring, it's really the center of our highest, you know, that where our gaze is, is the center of our highest acuity going back to all of our, our cones are concentrating in the small area of the fovea um, to get us acuity, and we lose, we lose detail beyond that. When you talk about leading lines and triangles, because of that lateral inhibition and the way our eyes will actually, you know, um, you know um, amplify or inhibit the electrical signals depending upon the intensity of the light or the nature of the color, whether it's antagonistic colors, you know, complementary, or, um, or they're, 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 they're kind of colors that, that are equal in terms of they, they don't perceive a lot of contrast. 
edges create um, we look for edges. It's, it's, it's inherent in our physiological, biological design. So that's why we, we interpret these edges. And it's what allows us to perfectly accept a three-dimensional world and depict it as a two-dimensional image because we're okay with that. And when you think about kind of that, um, and I'm, it's, it's not an image I have here, but the old, the Gestalt perception um, illustration where it shows the, the Pac-Man with the open mouths on three sides. And basically there is no triangle there, but looking at it, you can clearly see the Pac-Man's mouths are the, um, the corners, the vertices of each of, 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 each, um, of each of the triangle edges. There's no lines there, but our brain interprets it and fills in the vision, you know, fills it in. Same thing happening with kind of the leading lines and triangles. We're drawn to this. We're biologically kind of like wired to look at this and you can use it to affect and you can actually do it um, in post where you can even use some, um, um, you know, the tools of either changing the light using filters, gradient filters, brushes, whatever you want to do to even subtly change the exposure to the degree that it affects us on a subconscious level to lead us through the image. But we don't really look at it and say, oh, that's a halo or that's an, you know, oh, look at the edge on this. He obviously did something post or, um, or this is an HDR image gone wrong kind of a thing. Um, which, which just, you're playing essentially back to what we actually see, which is why I, I always have, I always find that people are like, oh, that's not what, you know, was actually there. You Photoshop this and you're like, actually our eyes and our brain are less capable than, are, are more capable than you give it credit for, but we interpret things a little bit differently. So we've been trained to see how cameras see um, and the way the film records things, as opposed to trying to enhance the way we actually do process images. Um, provided again that, um, we have normal vision or, or vision that most of us have because we've got color blindness. There's um, obviously you know, brain lesions. It creates um, spatial awareness or discontinuities, all those kind of things. So most people that look at these images um, are, are attracted to these kind of edges and, and use leading lines. Um, when you go to depth, um, it's really important to rely on those because contrast between luminance values starts to play an increasing role on it, as I talked about. Um, and one of the things that actually, um, if you look at... Um, um, you know, like some of these uh, illusions, um, and I've got, at the, again, at the end, I've got some books and things that you can refer to. Um, if there's blurred edges, we actually see the, 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 the value differently. So a blurred edge of a circle, for instance, where it looks like it's a dark circle, you can have the exact same level of black inside that circle. But depending on how, how distinct that edge versus how, um, how blurred it is, gives us the tonality or the value of it. So we'll actually see that as lighter if it's blurred because we're not having the greatest inhibition between that cross talking of, of our um, photoreceptors. Whereas if it's a very concrete line, our photoreceptors are activated to a greater degree and we see greater edges. So you can use that clarity and or increase or decrease it depending upon what you want to achieve. Um, the less more blurry it is and the less we see the contrast and, um, and, it's in, and it's in conflict with the color, the more we start to interpret movement ha happening because our brain is sensing movement when there actually is none. Again, something that we can use as we, we create these. Balance and symmetry um, is more something that um, it, it really, it, it evokes kind of this comfort and simplicity and, and there's no single focal point, but there's nothing in there that really um, sets us off. And I only bring this out because Again, we don't really understand emotionally why we respond to this as well, um, but it's something that, um, you know, again, from an artistic standpoint, as we do it all the time, and how distinct you make those edges or you change those 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 elements on either side of the of, of the line of where the balance is happening on both sides will dictate whether or not you're creating kind of tension within an, an image or or you're creating kind of a harmony um, and and a kind of a feeling of like okay, this is good, it's calming. Um, so you can create kind of that unnerving effect simply with how you, you, balance, um, you balance it. And you can achieve the balance, as I talked about, looking back to that, that, um, the, the Crack O'Brien illusion where the edge is drawn down, where you've got the same image. You can achieve balance simply by delineating a greater area of contrast at that line that you want to create, whether it's an imaginary one or it's a physical one like you see in this water line of, of the girls in the, um, in the pool. And then um, kind of the last piece is um, when you, you know, our photoreceptors get tired. Um, and so after a while, we tend to just blank out on negative space. And that can be effective if you, if you want to create a sense of um, kind of like um, isolation within an image where you don't fill the frame with an image. Um, and you can actually, you know, kind of appeal to that fact that it kind of blanks it out and it, it, you know that this is all going on because you're seeing it in the edges of your gaze, but you're, you're really concentrated on this one, you know, this one subject that's in the center. 
But it also works the reverse way is that if you fill the frame and you force, you know, especially for things that we're not as comfortable with, we don't know as well. Um, for us, you know, a nudibranch is a nudibranch, we're more familiar with them. But to somebody on land, it, they will get less of a sense of isolation and benefit from a fill of, of, of negative space because they're blank, you know, they blank out and they're trying to see the detail in this tiny little part of the frame, you know, the, 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 of the image, as opposed to filling the frame where they're actually trying to actually look at and build up and recognize the detail of what they find interesting without having kind of the tire of the the photoreceptors um so you're 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 you can actually achieve different emotional impacts depending upon how you fill the frame simply with how our photoreceptors turn on and off so how do i actually use some of this information um just kind of, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to kind of go through this bullet lights. The first thing is, is um, when I'm going into the water, I'm pre-visualizing and Jake um, Stout and I had this conversation a number of times in terms of, I always have an idea as to what I, what I want to actually achieve in terms of the vision when I go into the water. Um, what I'm also trying to pre-visualize though, is what's happening to my visual system and how I'm actually seeing the scene that I'm going to see underwater with either my, you know, the, the, the little light that I'm carrying with me, or if I'm in ambient light um, versus how my camera is going to capture it. So that's kind of the first thing that I'm starting to become aware of that. So at depth, um, I have to become aware of, of the greatest changes because the difference between, you know, landscape and topside and, and looking underwater is obviously how light is affected under, underwater. So with the luminance contrast occurring um, in the ambience area and in the ambient areas, and we're losing color contrast because it's becoming increasingly monochromatic, we can actually use that to advantage where if we're lighting something artificially, um, we can enhance the color contrast, recognizing that in the ambient areas of the scene, we might want to actually enhance something with the, the cones or going back to the wear system and enhance kind of our move, you know, the, 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 the sense of movement. Um, or to play on our, our photoreceptors in terms of, um, do we want us just to kind of blank out and get tired of it and then concentrate on just the color aspect or, or whatever. Um, the color contrast in the artificially lit areas plays a huge role, obviously, and we tend to like focus on that. Um, whereas when, you, when you're lighting up, um, whatever the subject is with our strobes and we have the limited ability to light strobes, you know, beyond a certain um, um, distance, especially underwater, because we all know kind of the, um, you know, the, the square of distances with how light really falls off exponentially in terms of being able to use strobes. Um, you can actually use that to your advantage. It's also one of the reasons why, um, especially for those kind of where you're, you're lighting artificially only a portion of the image, that I'll often use a single or my strobes are unbalanced. Um, we kind of go in and, and your first instinct as an underwater photographer when you're first starting out is to have the two strobes on either side like we see all the pros do and we tend to set them at the exact same um, output. And that works if we want to light the scene and what the subject is is the scene, not some specific, you know, kind of area within that we then will draw to very other areas of the image. So you want even unbalanced lighting across the entire scene because your entire field of view in essence is, is, is the subject you're trying to convey. But when you're starting to do artificial lighting on specific subjects, um, that's why the that's why the snoots are unbalanced strobe light to enhance shadows and texture and create those those um, that 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 three dimensional um, it's a three dimensional feel in a two dimensional space because of the decrease in perspective, the fall off of the light, all that. So a lot of people ask me, "It's like what's the single biggest thing I can do in terms of?" enhancing a subject underwater, if I'm not doing a broad scene is, I, I, I'll sit there and say, change the balance of your strobes or do everything with a single light strobe, which is in essence what a snoot does. And it creates this beautiful sense of texture and depth, um, which we see all the time, especially when you mount it against a black background, which further enhances that contrast between the subject and what we see. And again, going back scientifically, we like edges. Um, I also, um, knowing all this, I, com I, I compose for flexibility in post. Um, and what I mean by that is that on land, I have more time to, to kind of analyze the scene. Yeah, the light's changing, I get it. Um, you know, the sunset only lasts so long, but I'm not worried about the scene changing because, you know, I've got a slight change in my buoyancy control, so the scene, it's at an angle, or um, I, I don't have enough time to really figure out what is making this emotionally appealing to me. What is, what, what is this moment that I'm capturing? What is it about this moment that's, that's generating this kind of interest in me? Um, 
if I don't have time for that, I will back off intentionally and rely on the fact that I can crop later, I can adjust later um, in terms of the composition and how I want to frame that. Um, and it gives me the flexibility to get to gather information that I might not be able to recreate or that I don't want to go back and recreate because it's, it's going to be underwater. So I do some flexibility. The other thing that I do to bring it back to the way I saw it um, and not how just how the camera sees it is working in post. Um, and again, this is my single greatest argument for people that, you know, kind of like look down their nose and say, I don't, I'll, I'll never Photoshop because I want to capture what's there. And you're like, well, actually capturing what's there is, is capturing what you're seeing. And some, some things that you do in post actually bring that closer to the way your processing post brings it closer to the way your visual processing was happening at the time. Um, so I will go in with the local adjustment brushes and, and adjust for clarity, sharpness, graduate exposures like the Crack O'Brien illusion to enhance and draw my eye throughout the image as I do this. Um, the other thing that I'll do is, as I kind of mentioned, is I will use brushes and, and like gradient, you know, the radio filter is one of my favorites, especially if you can make it into ovals and stuff, to, to, to create areas of lightness through the image in a way that I want to be knowing that the eye is going to track to light and we're attracted and then it, it'll, it'll unconsciously see some of those boundaries of the different values of the exposure outside and within that, that filter um, to draw the eye through. So again, you don't want to make it like a, like a heavy vignette, but you can use it to, to emphasize the areas to create those triangles, leading lines, um, areas of lightness that your eyes follow that you physically, physiologically want to follow um, to create a better, more compelling photograph at the end. So final thought, um, as I said, I would love to be all those experts wrapped up into one, but it's not really possible. Um, and and I, what I'm hoping out of this is that um, you're going to start to think about some of these things and go chase your own rabbits. It may chase you down into some of the scientific studies that are done. You might be chased down into art that I discovered that I've never seen before. Um, you know, that I, that I learned more about that I didn't realize just how subtle and masterful some of these, um, these artists, especially the Dutch masters, um, they are just masters at working with, with light um, and, and shadows and texture. Um, you know, to kind of pursue that in terms of the area that you want to do and chase that rabbit where you want to go. Um, last thought, <laughs> everything I said could be completely wrong. Um, and it's probably different than I said, you know, said in the Boston Sea Rovers presentation as well. But that's my ghost of story and I'm sticking with it. Um, just as an idea, these are kind of some of the, um, the resources that, I, that I've gone to. I've got a list of these, by the way, so you don't have to worry about just the visual aspect of it. Um, but I find that everything from the science, the science side of it to um, understanding art better, to understanding the principles and elements you know, within you know, the visual arts, um, and then understanding, um, you know, kind of how our visual processing system perceives these right down to from the physiological standpoint to the way the brain interprets things um, based on, you know, it could be what you're conditioned for, as well as obviously um, which photoreceptors are activating and which cells are processing it as these electrical signals move through our brain to the various areas of, of the image. So I'm going to leave this up. Um, as I, as I see if I can actually come back, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to get out of the sharing screen mode. I'm going to do this so that I can actually now see folks. Um, so if anybody wants to take a picture of this, I can also make arrangements to send it out later, um, if that um, helps. Yeah, that would help. Why don't we do that? If you okay, and then I will um, stop sharing, and then I can actually um, see kind of the folks out there. So I'm going to take a breath. Uh, really? because it'll be my first one this actual session. Um, if anybody has any questions or you've got any like, you know, um, you know, kind of postulations that I will answer if I can, lie if I think that it's appropriate because it's more interesting than the actual facts or um, tell you that I don't know. Tom, that was absolutely fantastic. It really was. And I'm sure everyone else is going to agree with me. We'll now look at images differently. Uh, look at scenes differently, but certainly looking at our own images or paintings and, and seeing what's uh, how they how that image got to be what it is, and uh, that was really terrific, terrific. And so I am kind of looking any any you know kind of questions that you have out of this that um, kind of come to mind. I know I just dumped a ton of information, but it's more about generating interest than it is really answering or getting into it. Um, and if anybody, by the way, if there's anything that I said that's completely wrong because there is an ophthalmologist or a neuroscientist out there, 
hop in and, and let me know because I must have missed that part of the readings that I had. I don't, don't know if there is. All right, so I either stunned you guys to silence or it's just yeah. way too much. <laughs> uh, terrific. Really was. Um, and for, for, the, for everyone here watching, we, you know, we will send you that list, dear, but also I'll include uh, Tom's website. So if, you, if uh, on Saturday you're trying to take a break from shoveling and you're hiding from the snow, you feast on, this, on his website. It's really a, a collection of eye candy. So you will uh, definitely enjoy it. Hey, uh, Tom? Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, Charlie Maisel here. Uh, fantastic talk. Uh, my, my wife actually works in, in uh, uh, she's a specialist in a field called cortical visual impairment. Okay. So it's people who's, you know, take everything where your eye is working fine and doing what you say, but then uh, you don't see with your eyes, as you've said, you see here, you see with your brain. And, uh, you know, there, there's people who have problems with that processing and that's, um, uh, you know, there's ways to work with that, but it, it goes very much to this whole, you know, everything you were talking about. These are all things I, I hear when I'm talking with her. So that's just a comment on, on how, um, you know, stunningly good your presentation was. Thank you. Uh, but at least I didn't lie completely, Charles. <laughs> no, no, no. There's, there's a lot there that, that uh, yeah, that, that it was really terrific. Really, really great. Do you have... Um, uh, do you have an above water version of this? Um, so for my landscape photography, no, but you know, the, the principles are essentially the same. Um, where, where it differs is I don't kind of adjust my mind's view um, based upon the, the, the ambient light that I'm, I'm seeing at, at um, um, underwater, you know, so that the, the light properties is the single biggest factor, obviously, between the top side and the downside in terms sure. of how they play a role. But for my landscape, as I, I kind of think the same way. I, I look for the edges. I look for boundaries, edges of light and dark, um, earth and earth and air, all of that. Um, and, I'll, and I will enhance them to create the kind of that, that impression. One of the, probably one of the better examples is a naturally occurring phenomenon that happens because of the reflection of light in rainbows is you'll see that the upside of the rainbow actually is darker um, than, than the area beneath the rainbow. And, and that is the way you're actually seeing it. But I will enhance that with a brush across the edges of the outside of the rainbow to make it even more dramatic and more dark, for instance. Um, so there are some things that I'll do with that. Does so that answer was, your question, Charles? Uh, well, it, it, it does, but I have a reason for asking that, yep. is that I'm, I'm associated with a local uh, uh, photography group. Yep. And, uh, you know, we, we are always in need of, uh, you know, always have an eye out for good speakers. And I would be interested in... Um, uh, seeing if you might be interested in doing something that would, you know, essentially take a lot of what you did in terms of the, uh, the principles, you know, and how the principles and how that, you know, the art, you know, your, your examples for the art were wonderful, but turning that into, you know, composition, but more from, um, you know, composition and powerful visual images, but more, you know, with an above water focus. Yeah, it's, it would be easy enough to do, and I'd be glad to do that. Because obviously, yeah. you know, with the speed that I'm talking, I love talking about this stuff because I just find it so fast. Well, absolutely, no, that comes across. And, you know, and the other thing we're looking for is we're looking for, for uh, you know, we're looking for good speakers. <laughs> you know, okay, they're, well, they're, they're, the they're, curve low again. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're people who know their subject and are bad speakers, right? And, and okay. uh, you, are, you are a good speaker. So, um, Whitney, Whitney, who does the, um, what happens to the recordings of these things? So um, I can send it out via email to everybody if you're on the Photo Society list. I'll probably post it on the New England Underwater Photography page as well. So what I would like to do is I would then uh, take that link and pass it on to the head of our speaker committee. Sure. So that they can look at that, Tom, and, you know, sort of, sort of double check my things. And then uh, maybe, you know, if I can, uh, I don't have your email, but maybe Whitney, if you could send me Tom's email. Yeah, is that okay, Tom? We're good. Oh yeah, that's fine. That's perfect. And, yeah, perfect. Uh, I can coordinate that. Yeah, and I'll pass it on to a head of our speaker committee, and we'll, you know, we 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 plan pretty far in advance, and maybe we'll see about uh, see if it makes sense to get you on the program. If you um if you look under my website is actually thomasgately.com. Um, 
So even if you misspell it, fortunately, I've got a good enough SEO that it shows up. Um, my, my contact information is there as well. Um, okay, great. Yep. Yeah. Great, but fantastic presentation. Thank you. And we're gonna have to have a beer um, when COVID's over, when it's less more endemic, I guess, <laughs> with um, you and your wife, because I would love to have a conversation with what she sees and, and learns. Yeah, no, she works, um, uh, she tries to bridge. She's, she's at the uh, Perkins School for the Blind. Okay. And she's really, really created their cortical visual uh, impairment program there. It's become, wow. it, it turns out that, that CBI is the leading cause of blindness now. Oh. You know, they've taken care of a lot of things that used yep. to be the causes of blindness. And now you're left to this. And a lot of it is, um, uh, you know, neonatal uh, problems. It's, yeah. it's uh, seizures traumatic brain injury, things like that. One and, of the things uh, that I, I'm really fascinated, um, not to kind of divert too much, but um, uh, one of my best friends who um, did a presentation to the Audubon Society on how birds see. Um, you know, he very much, because a lot of, we've had this conversation back and forth um, as, as, you know, and he sees a lot of congenital eye defects, obviously as a pediatric ophthalmologist. Um, but the whole concept of like eagle vision versus human vision versus fish vision, um, you know, like eagles have, um, you know, peregrine falcons have three phobias. So I always found that fascinating. Is, so they can, they can track the wolf in the distance, the rabbit in the field, and whatever's happening over here all at the same time. You know, yeah. they don't need to build it up. It's just, it boggles, it boggles my mind. And she's always bridging the gap between the, uh, the educators, the ophthalmologists, and the neuroscientists. Yeah. So she works uh, with all of them. So yeah, let's, uh, we, can, we can connect. You'd probably be interested okay. in some of what she's doing. Any, any other kind of questions or I haven't kind of looked through the, um, Andy, you've been kind of scanning through even the chat to see if there's anything. Yeah, specific. I have been, and, and I, I, we don't have anything uh, at this point. Uh, I, my field get, gets into odor and, and perception of, of odors and okay. uh, much the same in terms of breaking it down in terms of what your, uh, your nasal, um, olfactory bulb senses and then how that's passed on to the brain is many similarities there. Um, so really we are, our senses can be refined to pick up all those various different things and, and it's what our brain interprets us and how we respond emotionally to, to all that. So there's a lot of similarly and similarity in all of our, our senses along the, on the line you were talking about. It seems like it would almost come down to is like the same way sound is kind of frequency and amplitude in terms of, you know, how high the pitch is or what we hear. You know, we see frequency amplitude in terms of the intensity of the brightness and the, and the hue, you know, within the spectrum. I'd imagine kind of hearing, you know, I mean, um, olfactory has the same kind of thing, intensity of the smell versus the distribution. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, again, going back to this, I just find it fascinating that uh, the way the brain works, because we just think that what we're seeing is what everybody else is seeing. Um, one thing I say, you know, kind of on the side that um, the first example that um, that that Hubel, um, that David Hubel had in his book that I found so fascinating. Now this is gonna, this is gonna appeal to people that actually remember back to tube TVs. Um, I'm, doesn't look like anybody here may never have seen a cathode ray tube, but um, when you think about it, like a, a CRT um, TV, when it's off, what color is it? Gray, right? It's kind of a dark kind of charcoaly gray. But when you're watching TV on one of those, you know that shadows or black, it's capable of this rich black, but it can't do any less light of a projection than it does when it's off. So how does that gray become black? And it's all happening because of the way our brain is changing and modifying our vision of it. Um, and that's kind of what started me on this whole road of just seeing it. So, so the brain, I, I imagine there's probably some element of the brain looks at the olfactory, you know, and, and does similar processing. Um, from all the senses in terms of making interpretations and taking the, the photoreceptors kind of like transmission of the electrical signal and deciding how and what it wants to do with it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, intensity, character, uh, and being able to pick out one note out of an orchestra playing a song, uh, being able to pick out one odor characteristic out of, you know, a yeah. complex uh, industrial, you know, setting, uh, being able to pick out certain light frequencies and vision um, out of you know, a complex field. All, all of those things have similarities and, and maybe it's because it's all connected to the brain. Oh, how about that? Yeah, no, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> of course, now you just introduced another rabbit that I need to go chase. <laughs>
Well, well uh, again, Tom, thank you very, very much. This was outstanding and a wonderful way to kick off uh, 2022. So this is terrific. Thank you. Um, and so we will get everyone the information that Tom said uh, that he was going to send. And uh, we'll see you all in February. And good luck tomorrow, or Saturday and Sunday with the snow. All right. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Tom, again, you there still, Tom? Yep, I'm still here. That was really was fabulous. Thank you. I, I just find it kind of a fascinating. I definitely, and it's definitely helped to improve my art over the years. Um, just, and I got to credit Lan, um, Galen Royal. Um, his, you know, even as, you know, he's a landscape guy and, and right. you know, with mountain light and stuff, but mm -hmm. um, his his desire to understand what was happening behind just kind of the superficialness um, and understand the science behind it was just kind of invigorated me and, you know, energized me to like, just for the past few decades, every time something else comes out on this, I just try to explore it more. Well, sure. Cause I have so much time in my day, right? <laughs> <laughs> home eating homemade bread. Cause you know, you're afraid because of home lights to go to the grocery store. Well, if you guys both find any time in your day, I'd love to have you come Amen. down to my marine biology class and and do a do a lesson if you like, either <laughs> remotely or in person. Sure. Yep. Yeah, I'd be glad to, Matt. Yeah, I hate talking. You can tell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have uh, fifteen kids this semester, and so it's a little different. I've been trying to get more and more people to come in and just do a little talking. So I usually get one or two people per year to come in and speak. But yeah, so let me know and uh, we'll work out something. Yep. I'd be glad to. Excellent. Um, and Andy, thanks for the extra time too. Um, I, you know, Sea Rovers, I just didn't feel like I could give it the justice that it needed, whereas this seemed a lot. Right, for sure. Kind of yeah. appropriate, and, yeah. Sea Rovers, they really hemmed in and it's really tight. And uh, yeah, you, with this, this presentation, yeah, you couldn't fit this into a smaller. Uh, smaller oh, I tried. I, I definitely tried. <laughs> you I, did a hell of a job. I didn't breathe the entire time, but I tried. <laughs> All right, so I will uh, sign off, and uh, thanks okay. again. All right, thank Take you. Yep. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Whitney, that was outstanding, huh? Yeah, that was great. It was a great way to kick off the year. There definitely was. Nice. So, uh, all right. Well, it's after eight thirty, so you've had a long day, and I will. Uh, I'll talk to you. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Good luck on Saturday. Well, thanks. You too. <laughs> thanks. You're not going to be open on Saturday. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Take care. Take care. Bye.